Welcome back to the Hoops Temple Podcast. Y'all know me, Nathan Schwartz. Joining me from Sacramento in his cozy living room den slash office, Aaron Schroeder. How's it going? It's going fantastic. Yeah, I got evicted from the uh, nice studio apartment that had the the radio station, and now I live in a mansion um, brought to you by StreamYard. Uh, brought to you by StreamYard. What's the man? I'm ruining this. What is the term? Um, tell I me. I don't know. Yes, you do. <laughs> generic. Brought to you by StreamYard Generic Backgrounds. It's, it's the basic package. We're not fancy mm-hmm. here. We can't <laughs> afford the uh, the promo, the premium sh- stuff. So uh, yeah, you get the basic backgrounds, and maybe mm-hmm. maybe you can upload your own image. Can Can you upload your own image? You can. You can. I could be oh. wherever. Well, yeah. Why aren't you wherever? This is my house. I own this house. Okay. Fair enough. Well, you know what? We're here to talk about who owns the house that is the Western Conference today. We are doing Western Conference and season previews. Uh, we've pulled up some over-unders. We've talked through some things. Or we've planned out. We've done our projections for all of the teams. And to order this, because I felt like Dylan and I went a little willy-nilly, a little bit of chaotic, um, partially because there's time zones involved and uh, uh, the recording got thrown around. But to order this, uh, we're going to go with the Vegas over-unders. And because we don't encourage sports betting, and it seems to be becoming even more and more prevalent, we're not going to tell you whose over-unders we stole. We're just going to say a, a generic over under because uh no free ads if you would like us to start plugging your sports betting stuff we do accept cash credit card checks um i'll accept an edible arrangement um pretty cheap i only accept cash everything under everything there we go all right yeah under the table of course naturally All right, Uh, so the number one team in the Western Conference as projected by Vegas is the Oklahoma City Thunder with a projection of 57 and a half wins. Aaron, how are you feeling about the Thunder this upcoming season? Worse than I did a week ago. The Hardenstein injury is is kind of driving this for sure. Uh, Five to six weeks, I think with the same injury Sabonis had, it must be to a greater degree, given that he's missing more than a month. Um, That hurts them. That's going to hurt them. But they're still a foundational 57-win team from last season. And uh, they swapped Josh Giddey for Alex Crusoe in the offseason. I'll say Alex Crusoe is a pretty good basketball player. But Alex... I'll say Josh Giddey is a pretty good basketball player. But Alex Crusoe is an exceptional one. And he's going to get them to 60 wins. And that's where I ended up with them. And I'm going I'm going over for 57 and a half. So I thought it was funny. You, me, Dylan, and Jack, the Kings fan, we all put our wins into the same spreadsheet without really discussing it with each other. We kind of save that for here. You know, we maybe text a little bit. All four of us independently came up with 60 wins for the Thunder. Yeah, it feels perfect. And you know what I had him before, right? Did you have them at 59 and a half? 68. Oh, you went super high. Yeah, I was all in on the Thunder super team. Like, this is going to be one of the greatest teams of all time. Did you just see the best Western Conference regular season team add Alex Crusoe and then fix the one problem they had, which was rebounding with one of the best rebounders and defensive bigs in the league? It's like, is are we just pretending that's not happening? And they're a real young team, and they should get better. I thought they were going to steamroll teams. Like, I still think they'll be the best defense in the league, and I'm not sure about the offensive end, but I think they should be top five in both categories, just like they were last year. I, I largely agree with you, but that makes for boring podcasting. So, for the sake of the <laughs> podcast, I'm going to play a little bit of devil's advocate on where things could go wrong, which I think they've got two areas where it could fail. One with Hartenstein already injured. They do have a pretty weak front court. I mean, behind Hartenstein and Chet, the only other really like power forward center that I expect to get major minutes is Jay Will, the other Jalen Williams. Usman Dang maybe is a little bit ready for something, but 
it's it's a weak front court outside of those those core guys, and injuries could stack up. The other area where I could see them struggling a bit is just the kind of individual shot creation. I really love J Dub. I think he can become something good. I think All Star is is a relatively. I don't think it's that far far away. I think that's a potential benchmark that he could hit this season. West is super deep, so maybe not. But I think he could at least be in that stratosphere. Um, but really, outside of Shea, they haven't had anyone that has shown thus far that you give them the ball, you ISO, you clear out, they're going to get you a bucket. And maybe their offense is fluid enough and they've got enough weapons, and enough shooting, that that doesn't matter. But I think in close games, you get down to you know nut crunch time, if they're not blowing people out, that could cost them a game or two. It could. It could. But I still feel like with SGA, you get one of the three best scoring guards in the league some nights. I mean, he was he was 30 efficient points last season. If that's your go-to ISO guy, how much am I going to be complaining about what Jalen Williams is bringing? He should be fine. He should be fine. And, and Chet Holmgren should develop offensively too. I mean, he has this... the the tools, the physical tools and the, the ability with the ball in his hands. They also changed his shot form, which I saw people kind of complaining about. But if you watch the end of last season, he kind of slumped with the three pointers. And those are some like laser, no arc kind of bricks. And they're trying to get him to kind of push more. So I, I'm, I still mm-hmm. feel like he'll be a good shooter. Um, We had Jalen Williams at 35 and Chet at 31 heading into next season for our top 100 ranking. Yeah, well, I I don't disagree with those rankings. I think I had them each a tad bit lower, but just I see them as very good two-way players. They have the defensive impact. If things do stagnate on offense or if Shea misses sometimes, that's where I, I do have the worry. It's just I don't think either of them has the, the ability to carry a team's offense or be the focal point as of yet. But as two-way complete defensive players, this team is just going to be a pain in the ass to try to score on. Like they're awesome. If you're a guard, you will either be defended by Lou Dort, Alex Caruso, or Shea. As a forward, you've got to deal with with Jalen Williams, Chet Holmgren, yeah, even like Kason Wallace and Aaron Wiggins. Those guys, those guys are tough. Kendrick Williams, Kaysen's great defender, is Kendrick. Like, it's a really solid all around team that there's no no real weak links. I mean. Isaiah Joe might be the weakest link. There's right. no weak link. The weak link is no 45% weak. from three. Yeah, you're going to talk about your weak link being their 11th guy. That's everyone's weak link. This is going to be the best defense in basketball. I want to note the Giddy thing, because I think people liked Josh Giddy's game. Turns out he has an affiliation for underage women. Got to stop doing that. Can't do that anymore. But in, on the basketball court, I think he showed some interesting flashes as a kind of a bigger kind of passing playmaker that I think he'll be able to really flesh out like in Chicago. Cause none of those basketball games matter, but in OKC, I mean, Oh my God, getting Crusoe is, is unbelievable. Yeah. That's, that's just the right fit. You know, Giddy might be a floor raiser to say like, if you put him on a bad team, he's going to do more. He played well with the Olympic squad, um, and, and I think that could translate well to being in Chicago. You know, Patty Mills kind of plays a little bit like a Kobe White as far as just their downhill style of attack and their, their shooting. Like, you could probably recreate something similar with those guys in Chicago. In OKC, there wasn't the need for him, and Caruso raises that ceiling, so 100% in. All right, you're going over to our second, yeah, I'm going over. We actually, we sucked at doing these over-unders. Vegas is taking all of our money. Why is that? Because, well, so our listeners will will note that we go over on a good number of teams mm. uh, and under on a good number. That basically evens out. But w- as we get into it, they'll see a pattern here that mm. um, I think Vegas... I think Vegas knows what they're doing. They know how to set these lines to trap us, especially because yeah. a lot of these teams, we went over by a half a point before we had Vegas lines, before we put those in there. And so, mm-hmm. like, Vegas makes money for a reason. 
<laughs> no, they do. They do. I think I'll spoil the the, the trend that's coming um, just because I think it's important to know. We went over on basically every playoff team. Um, in fact, we did. Not every playoff. We went over on the top six. We went over on um, eight and nine and basically under on all the, the non-playoff teams. And I think it's not that Vegas is wrong, but I'm just really anticipating an incredibly strong Western Conference led by its top teams. And like, if you're not a good team, you're just going to lose a bunch of games. And it's hard to like, mm-hmm. I think the gravity at the bottom of the league, because this draft class is really good, is going to be really strong. It's going to drag these teams down. Or it's like, you tell me the line for the Jazz is 27 and a half wins. They're not winning 27 games. They're not winning 28 games. Like, this is a team that's going to be tanking. They have no reason not to just lose games from the start because the top end of the next draft class is insane. Kevin Garnett has already called Cooper Flag a cold ass white boy. Utah didn't need to hear anything else. They're like, let's go to the yeah, bottom. Dude. Let's I, <laughs> I have so there's this great like Sports Illustrated, or is it Sports Illustrated? But it's like the book of basketball. Like all these pictures. And I had it as a kid and I, I saw it again recently. Um and I saw it was like a full two pages. It's two feet of paper of the Michael Jordan. Mm, no, it's different. Um, of like Michael Jordan's shot um, in the 98 finals. And uh, you know how many, how many um, non-white people I saw in the background of that photo? It's not that either. It, it's literally Jordan, uh, Brian, uh, Byron Russell, and just a sea of fans. There's one black dude in the background of that photo. There's one. Just one. That's Utah is going to need Cooper. Needs Cooper flag. I wonder if I have it. <laughs> I feel like if I just keep keep grabbing back, I'm gonna gonna get <laughs> it's it. It's a eventually. huge book. But you get what I'm saying? You know, I think you're right. You're right. But I was like, I hadn't even noticed that, and I looked in the background. And I was like, this is the whitest get to like get together in, in like in sports history is like Utah Jazz games. And and the thing is, yes, Utah incredibly white, but in, to, to zoom out the draft. <laughs> there are like yeah. four other guys that people talk about being in the Cooper flag conversation for the yeah, number one pick. Bailey. Like there's, there's a chance that we could have five building blocks, five franchise guys, five number one, number two options on playoff teams in this, this next draft. And so like, Hey, you have some early injuries and you're starting to look bad. You figure out a way to shut this shit down. Like the Spurs, I know the Spurs want to be good. The Spurs pivoted so hard when David Robinson got hurt because they saw Tim Duncan coming. And the same people that ran that franchise back in 98 are running that franchise today. Like, if they get off to a slow start, all of a sudden it's, hey, Victor, you want to try some French wine tastings? I think they need you to, like, cut the key back in, you know, uh, Versailles or something, not cut the key, cut the ribbon, you know, be presented mm-hmm. with the key. Like, you're going to have some reason to send it back to France. So, yes, a lot of our, our bad teams are, mo- we're taking the under. A lot of our good teams, we're taking the over. Um, with that said, team number two, according to Vegas in the West, is the Minnesota Timberwolves with 51 and a half. You went 53, I went 52. The others are in that ballpark we're all over i think i put my numbers in and i definitely built our spreadsheet before they got julius randall before they got dante divincenzo i don't know if that makes me more or less excited for them would you be happier with them if they still had towns or just what are your thoughts i actually haven't been on the pod to discuss the towns trade yet I, I do feel like it was my favorite trade of all time because it was two fan bases with depressed assets that were delusional about how valuable those assets were getting them exchanged for each other. <laughs> and so they were both like, what the hell? That's all we got. And it's like, no, like, yeah, the player you traded isn't that good. And that's all it's all he's worth. I'm sorry. Like the contract sucks. It's not that like to get off the town's money is like priceless. That's the worst. That's like one of the 10 worst contracts in basketball. 
In fact, if you caught me and Dylan's worst contracts draft, we said it was. It's an insane price point for like a top 40-ish guy. And for the Timberwolves to get back Randall, who's looking for a new contract, DiVincenzo, who I really love for them, he's going to help their defense stay at the top of the league or close to it. And just getting the financial freedom to now we're, we're in the ant era. Like we're fully heading towards the Anthony Edwards era. And that's really exciting. There's no, like it had been the currently towns era for so long. And now we're finally picking like a really strong direction. And, and so I felt like this team is still going to win over 50 games And Julius Randall. Like while the fit is kind of odd and it kind of always is on all, every team he plays for because of the lack of spacing, because it takes him forever to get into his sets. It makes me a little concerned but he has been a good regular season player. Like he will contribute to wins and uh, has financial reasons to have to keep playing well. Cause he wants a, he wants his new deal. Um, I think they'll hit the over pretty easily. I think that he, so I, I think Randall is going to play actually much better with Gobert than anticipated, but it wouldn't shock me if he gets moved to the bench and uh, I've said that and people have kind of reacted like, ah, oh, how can you move a multi-time all-star, multi-time all-NBA guy to the bench? And I'm like, I think Nas Reed is a better fit with that starting lineup, the spacing he provides. And Randall coming off the bench, getting to turn over the offense to him, having him be the primary guy, like that is going to be the key role for Randall. That is Randall's future for in this league. I don't think there's a team out there that's going to give Randall big money next season. I think team next season will maybe give Randall 20, maybe 25 mil, which as, as the cap keeps jumping up and maybe I'm just underestimating how much the cap is going to raise by, but he's not going to be paid like a one, two, or maybe a three, uh, third option. You know, he's, he's going to be teams fourth or fifth highest guy. He's looking at like Contavious Caldwell Pope or Aaron Gordon type money. Um, and I think transitioning to the bench might be really useful both for him and for the Wolves, for him, because it shows he's willing to accept that role, it shows, shows that he can do it and hopefully do it well, uh, which I think will open up the market for him this offseason. Uh, and for the Wolves, it just it makes more sense. I actually think, oh, I'll, g- I'll give you a chance to respond to that. What do, what do you think about Randall to the bench? I think it's the right move, but that's the hardest conversation in basketball is... Hey, remember when you made those all NBA teams? Yeah, I want you to come off the bench now. Because you know what I'm most excited about? Conley, DiVincenzo, Ant, Gobert, who's who, uh, and Nas Reed lineups. Right? Something like that. Something that doesn't involve him at all. And that, like, that's what I'm most interested in. And uh, mm-hmm. he, given his contract, given his stature, he's going to want more. And it's, I don't, I just don't think it's possible. He's going to be starting. It's the same thing for Beal. The same when we get to the Suns, Beal should come off the bench. There's no reason for him to be starting, but you can't do it. I think with Beal, you have to at least salvage the relationship enough because of how long the contract is and how much is on it. I think with Randall, Uh, Randall, you can already just be like, Hey, okay, you're unhappy. We're going to look to trade you by the deadline. If we don't move by the deadline, then we wash our hands of you and good luck finding a contract next season. Um, you and Brandon Ingram can go reminisce about how great it was to be Lakers once upon a time and talk about how you both want $200 million contracts and are probably signing for a team's mid- mid-level exception. I do think that the Wolves have the leverage. That if he's gonna be, yeah. if he's gonna throw a tantrum, it's gonna be rough for him because the the contracts are. He is this year and then a $30 million player option. Um, and so they're like, Hey, like whatever, get out of here. We like, we got off towns as money. We got to Vincenzo. Well, we have a great team anyways. Um, but yeah. And I also, I really, I like the Rob Dillingham acquisition. I don't think he's really going to be in the rotation, but just to say like Conley is getting old. He's not going to play forever. I mean, would you be sh- surprised if towards the end of this season, it's Dillingham instead of Conley? I think it might be Dante. You know, because I, I think Edwards will have the ball in his hands more often. So I think you can possibly get away without like a true point guard. Like the mm-hmm. Jordan Bulls never really had a true point guard. Um, the like the Kobe Lakers. 
I, I don't love it either because he doesn't distribute as well, but I think you could implement a system where you don't need him as much at point. How many if you are starting Randall? In total is DiVincenzo and and Randall, Gobert, and whoever getting as a lineup. Is that seven assists McDaniels? per game com- combined? Yeah, McDaniel. I should have plugged in McDaniels in the read spot of my, my hypothetical five. But anyway, I just I really like DiVincenzo's fit. Um long term looks good, short term looks good. They got out of the cat money, dude. This is great. And I just ate it up because yeah. I'm the biggest cat hater in the world. And so to finally be like, yeah, your favorite player got traded for Julius Randall. But yeah, it's fine, you know, and the Wolves fans don't have to fight anymore, dude. It's not your it's not your battle. I, you know, we won. We both won. I was right. <laughs> Cat isn't worth that much. You were right. You don't have to fight for him anymore. Uh, fair enough. I, I don't know how much we'll see of Rob Dillingham this year, but I, I do like the pick. I Not a time. think he'll be good next year. And Terrence Shannon, we did our draft. I picked Terrence Shannon going to the Timberwolves. Mm-hmm. I said he could play immediately. He could make an impact. Uh, his value was being depressed by a really weird court case. Um, and he's looked good. Him and Luca Garza looked good in this preseason. How old is Luca Garza now? 28? I have no idea. It's 20, almost 26. Like, almost like 29 26. points last night. Nice. Yeah, looks good. <laughs> looks good. Also, I think for the Knicks, because I wasn't here for the Eastern pod, but like the Knicks will be able to supplement a good defense around Cat because their perimeter defense is so good. Um, but there's a mm-hmm. reason Pat doesn't play center. Like there's a reason they paired him with the best rim protector of the league and played him a power four. Dude doesn't defend the rim. Can't defend the rim. Like and good luck with it, basically. Uh, that's my that's my thought. Yeah. Wait, right. I have another question. Let's move last on season. To the, to the dead. Wait, last season. I forget the exact number. We're 20 minutes Give in. Me- we've talked about two teams. <laughs> Give me one second. This is important. God damn it. <laughs> so we're gonna okay. be here all day. Last season, two players committed 200 plus fouls while getting less than 50 steals and blocks. One was Cat. Do you know the other one? 200 fouls, less than 50 steals. Less than 50 Gobert? blocks as well. More than 200 oh, fouls, less than, less than 50, 50 blocks steals, and, steals. and less than 50. Yeah. It's Grant Williams. It was Cat and Grant Williams. Randall? Oh. <laughs> that's, that's, I'm just saying, that's the company of room protection. You know? The cats. Okay. It's a fucking fouling say, nightmare. Some people think Grant Williams <laughs> is good at defense. Anyways. All right. Moving on. Fine. All right. De- Denver Nuggets time. Uh, they came in fourth in our, well, actually fifth in. They're third in Vegas projections with a 50 and a half win total. Uh, we both took the over, although neither of us have them as the third. Well, I actually have them as the second. Either way, Denver, what are we thinking? What are we feeling? How big is the loss of Contavious Caldwell Pope going to be? Can it be upset by the addition of, of Russell Westbrook or development by Julian Strother, Juliet Strother? Um Christian Brown, what are we thinking? It is interesting because you see Jokic can win 47 games with Will Barton, no Jamal Murray, basically, no Michael Porter Jr. Like, um, was it Faku Compazzo? I forgot how to pronounce that guy's name. Um, it's a disaster. Like, yeah, but you, you can abbreviate his name. Is Jokic worth 48 wins? Basically, like, could he take any team to 45 wins? So probably, but then you say like, well, this team is obviously getting worse. They have zero three-point volume and they lost their best three-point shooter or one of their best in KCP. And that guy, that guy also played great defense. This team has to get worse, right? But like, can you get worse with Jokic? Is Jokic just like a roster immunity? No matter what you do, bring on the worst, least compatible player of the last five years, Russell Westbrook, and he'll get to 50 wins anyways. Maybe. Do you, that's know, how, it do you know how many wins they've won? Do you, do you know how many wins they've won over the last six years? How many wins they have, like on average? Yeah. Yeah. 
I, mean, I think they they basically averaged out like a 52 win pace each season. So last season was 57. The prior season was 53, 48, 47, 46, 54. Mm. But two of those seasons, the 47 and the 46, were the shortened years, both mm. of which those seasons, they were on pace for well over 50 wins if they just played the games. So we're looking at one year in the past six seasons, despite all of the Jamal Murray injuries, despite all of the like lack of players around him. He's just having Jokic is pretty much a guarantee for 50 wins. It's what we've seen for the last six seasons. You could implode the roster around him and it's happened and he got you 48 wins. So I'm, I'm not really too concerned about them getting under 50. Um, I actually went as high as 55 wins just for my projections because I do think that you know Denver has more assets, more weapons than we fully give them credit for. Um, and some of the young guys, and I think R- Russell Westbrook, weirdly enough, the way Jokic plays, if he's off the court, you can kind of do a facsimile of that putting Westbrook in that position because the, the Nuggets run so much through Jokic. That kind of all the other guys are, hey, how do we play off of him? You know, Porter Jr., he's not he's not an ISO scorer. He's not going to, like, back a guy down, turn around, hit a jumper over him. He's not going to Carmel Anthony it. He's going to run around and try to catch and shoot. So you need someone else who will generate, and that's what Russell Westbrook, in brief moments for short stints against reserve units, is still good at. Is Westbrook the only player in league history who averaged 11 points per game in the previous season that you have to build your team around? Like, you just have to focus, like, on how to construct everything around him because his flaws are so big. Yeah, if every if every defender in the league, if every defender on the other team lines up on the baseline with their backs turned, he can shoot 36% on three-point attempts. But the spacing issue is just it is bad, and it doesn't help. It just doesn't help, and, I, and I, they can't play together because Westbrook is is a disaster off the ball. If you're going to run your offense through him, like have fun with that. I, I think the Nuggets will have the second best starting five in in the Western Conference, just behind OKC. Um, but they will have one of the worst bench. I, I said the Lakers, the Spurs, and the Jazz are the only teams with worse bench units than the Nuggets in the West. Did you put Portland in there? Did you glitch out? No, I did Portland. I actually didn't. The thing with okay, the thing with Portland is they have okay. <laughs> they're bent. No, the think about this. <laughs> no, no, no. Think about this. Portland no. is terrible. No, no, no. no. <laughs> I'm right about this. Wait, Portland is awful. Uh, okay, they're the next one. To be fair, um, Portland's bench is actually better than their starting five, but they just don't know it yet. <laughs> They don't realize that. And so their starting five is actually horrendous. And their bench is also horrendous. Oh it's it, <laughs> it's worth about 18 wins, and we'll get to that. Uh, but it's I'm not saying their bench is good. I'm saying that every single player they have is bad. <laughs> I, okay. I don't, know yeah. to, I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> All right. So again, we've taken the over for the Nuggets. Um, uh, they're still going to be great. They're still going to win 50. Fourth place in the West. We actually have two options here. We both went over on the, both of these teams. So I'm going to go with the one that we went over by the more uh, with 48 and a half wins per the Vegas projections are the Dallas Mavericks. Were you surprised that the line is 48 and a half? That feels low. Like we easily exceeded that. It does feel low. They they had a slow start to last season, got PJ Washington, got Gafford, caught fire, and then landed about the same spot. They should be able to keep going. I got to ask, would you feel better about the Mavs line if they didn't have Clay Thompson at all? Yes. Right? That's what I was thinking. I When I think about our projections for him, I honestly, like, he's not even a part of my thought process. He is... I don't know how he made your guys' version of the top 100. He is not going to be the third best Mav. He is not going to be the fourth best Mav. Like, he'll be lucky if he's the fifth best Mav in this next season. And that that's no disrespect to what he was with Golden State and who he has been over the course of his career. But when you don't play basketball for three years, basically, 
900 something days. It was close to a thousand days between games for him. You're just not the same player anymore. And like at this point, I think Clay can catch and shoot. He can still run around some screens, but he no longer has the burst to get around them and create as much separation from his defender. And then defensively, put him on power forwards. He doesn't have the quickness to stay with guards uh, or, you know, agile wings at this point. Like, can you imagine a playoff series where he's trying to chase Dante DiVincenzo around? Man's going to get cooked. You can't play Luca, Kyrie, and Clay at the same time. You cannot. There's not a defensive front court on earth that you could you could build around that to make it viable. It's not going to happen. And, and the Mavs aren't going to do that. And so is Clay not going to start or is he not going to close? There, it's just a disaster combination of player that used to be really good is not good anymore. Definitely still thinks he's that good. Wants his shots when he probably when you have two other players that are some of the most efficient and impactful offensive players in the league and he sucks on defense. So I'd say like clay shots are going to be less valuable per point than Kyrie or Luca. And he sucks on defense. And I like the floor spacing. He spaces the floor a ton, but in the end you're kind of getting someone that is giving more than he's just as much as he's giving up. Um, they're getting just as much as he's giving up. And it's just, he's going to average, you know, 16 points a night. He's going to take a ton of threes. But I, I do wonder if we overrated him in the top 100. We, we placed him at 88. And the more I looked at it, the more I was just like, I just don't know if the fit's right. Um, he's lower than he was last season. We've, you know, he's kept going down. But I just, the reason I like Dallas, Luca, Kyrie, plus defense and shooting. <sighs> doesn't really involve clay he helps in the shooting but hurts in the defense to the point where i'd rather like Najee marshall play yeah Najee marshall maxi kleber yeah even some of the young guys that um that showed some promise Jaden hardy um i still have a lot of quentin Grimes stock but i'm getting really freaking annoyed of everyone when they bring up the mavs talking about how much quentin Grimes stock they have because like i'm just saying quentin Grimes stock should be low and it feels like every podcast I listen to, the guy's always like, man, they fleeced the Pistons. They got Quentin Grimes. And I'm like, Quentin Grimes wasn't playing for the Pistons last year. Like, <laughs> I still have he stock. Looks good, he looks good. But he does. It's just every single podcast, everyone's like, I still have Quentin Grimes stock. I'm like, someone should be selling. This stock is high. <laughs> Who's <laughs> like, he playing for, though? Because you can't play... He's not going to take Kyrie or Lucas minutes. Like so, I just don't. I don't see the fit on how he's he actually going to get in the game. But he's he's a good player. It, it, sure, he's a good player. small forward. It, it, it's the Clay Thompson replacement. It's it's how tall is he can guys. compete defensively. Uh, like six five. It's not huge, but I don't. I don't he'd be a smaller that. small forward. Well, fine, look it up. He's six five. Then you're right. Nah. Boom. Clay's only six I, six. What's going on? I don't know. In my head, Grimes like six three, and Clay's like six seven. But no, nah, that's all right. All right. We went over, over Ooh, again, and over. Phoenix Suns. Well, actually, let's just say it. Uh, Dallas, you had fifty-five wins. I had fifty-four wins. Maybe we did go a bit high for these guys. Just saying, we discussed all the problems with Clay. If they get off to a, uh, you know, kind of a rocky start because they think Clay should be starting. Clay is a rough start. They work him out of the rotation. Maybe that's where they they drop down to that forty-eight and a half. But this feels like a pretty easy over in my mind. Yeah, all right. Uh, fifth team on Vegas's board, 48 and a half wins for the Phoenix Suns. You went for 54 wins. I went for 51 wins. Tell me why Bradley Beal is going to be an all NBA team this year. Well, I don't have anything for that, <laughs> but I think Beal should have a bounce back season. And I think the bounce back for him is just playing in more games. If he is what he was last year, but can play in 60 games and the sun should be fine. Um, they also added in Tyus Jones and Monty Morris, who I really like. Like, I like those guys to just kind of plug and play point guards next to legitimate offensive creators. Uh, I think some of their issues come playoff time where it's like the only players that could touch the ball ever were Kevin Durant and Devin Booker. And that's kind of a problem. The sun should be able to win 50 plus games last season. They got close to it after what I'd say was a disaster of a season where they traded for Bradley Beal and he was never healthy. Now adding him their third best player 
why can't they just get to 50 wins again? I don't, I don't know why the line would be set where it is um, at 48 and a half. I mean, do you think they're going to, is this just a bet against Beal's health again or bet against Durant's health? Like, because it has to be a health thing. This team is good enough for 50. I'm going to say a bet against Beal's health might push Phoenix in the right direction. This might be a bet for Beal to be healthy because he will drag them down. You think Beal is a negative asset on the court? I mean, so if the ball is, they're playing point guard. That seems to be the, one, the way they want to start, either Tyus Jones or Monte Morris. Mm -hmm. Then you've got Booker and Durant. I think you would be better suited to have another wing defender out there, whether that's Royce O'Neal, Josh Okogie. Ryan um, Dunn. One of those two. Draft. Yeah. Having, having someone who can play defense out there, I think would be more individually valuable. If you're not going to have one of those guys, the other guy out there that's not being the play initiator and is not Durant or Booker is spacing the floor. In which case, in my mind, I'd rather have Grayson Allen, who is a better catch and shoot player than Bradley Beal. So yeah. he's not going offensively to or not defensively. <laughs> He should modern it. Ginobili it. It would be he more should. Wouldn't that be cool, beneficial. right? It should fit. I, I think you, I don't know. It'd be hard to, he's like, because I think Beal's like, I'm an NBA guy. I got max money. I'm making 50 million. You want me to come off the bench? There's no way you could convince him to do that, but he should. Now, I've got to talk about Ryan Dunn, though, because I feel like for him, it was, hey, this guy is the best defensive player in the draft, but he can't shoot. And now he just can shoot. Okay, he should have gotten in the top 10. And, and I think he yeah. would have been projected there had he shot better from three in college because he really is a great defender. And so when I see Phoenix, I see I think Dunn's going to play. I think they're going to have better point guard play. Durant is never going to be a bad player ever until he retires. Um, Beal should be more healthy. This team will win upwards of 55 games. I had him at 54. I had him at 51. They also really short up the front court. I mean, Yusuf Nurkic is starting. Mason Plumley. Looked fine to good. Um, Kendrick Perkins what said he's the difference. From and Kendrick Perkins knows so much that ESPN kept him over Zach Lowe. Fucking, Fucking stupid. stupid. Such a stupid um, product. But the other guy, and I've fallen in love with Oso Iguodaro, who he, like, lanky, he's always in the right spot. Um, it's because they played the Lakers twice that I've watched two of their preseason games. And then I went to their Pistons game at, uh, at Michigan state. So like, I've seen more Suns preseason basketball than any other non Lakers team just because they played the Lakers a bunch. Um, but this kid knows where to be. He's in the right spot. He's offensively a little bit weak, a little bit limited, but he moves the ball. He doesn't try to do too much. I think that there is um, a defensive version of Miles Turner, like what Miles Turner was when Sabonis was there, of like, let me defend the rim and kind of space, not the modern offensive heavy Turner that's kind of forgotten to play defense, um, or like a, a more modernized version of Serge Ibaka with a little bit less muscle. I, I think there's, I think there's hope. Uh, maybe not this season, but mm. two, three years down the line. Yeah. I'm I'm really high on what he could be now. You're only saying Miles Turner forgot how to play defense because Zach Eady ate him up. I was here first. <laughs> no. Zach Eady, no, I was the only one out of you four, out of us four, to say that Zach Eady was going to be a good professional player. And now here he is. Zach oh, seven foot four guy with a great touch is good at basketball. Who would have fucking thought? Come on, guys. I knew you were going to do this to me. I knew yeah. it. That's why. <laughs> In the hour before recording this, I did the all <laughs> possessions recap of Memphis, Indiana. And you know who Zach Eady ate alive? Miles Turner. No, he ate James Wiseman alive. He cooked <laughs> hey, Wiseman, Wiseman really time big. and time again. <laughs> yeah. yeah. James Wiseman's going to play for Indiana. Yeah. Hey, think about it. Eady's going to be great. He's going to be a great pro. And it, it, people way overthought that. Um, they overthought it. And I think he does. He doesn't look lost or lumbering or slow on his feet at all. Great transition to the Memphis Grizzlies, who yeah. are the sixth team in uh, in the Western Conference per or Vegas. Forty six and a half wins. Is this just all ED uh, propaganda or do we have some other feelings? I have nothing else. 
outside of Zach Eady. There's not a player on this team worth talking about. There's one player that's good, and it's Zach Eady. He's going to average 20 and 10. You get John Morant back, and that's really what's important. I'll transition to something real. Um, you get John Morant back, and last season was like the one of the worst seasons I've ever seen from a team in regards to like, hey, what could go wrong? What if everything went wrong? What if your star player didn't just get hurt, but they were the biggest moron in the entire league? And you get both those things, and everybody gets hurt. They like, go ahead, like let's have have a ball. And, and now you get back. Jaron Jackson Jr. is already injured. Gigi Jackson's already injured. We're doing it again, but maybe not as bad. If you can have healthy jaw, you got. They should make the play in. Um, they should make the playoffs. Um, Ed is it going to be a good fit? I, I really like Ed next to Triple J because Triple J cannot rebound, and Ed is a little too slow. They complement each other in a way where they can play together, and you can go Triple J at center or just Ed at center without each other for more versatile lineups. Do you think they start with them together or start with them uh, staggered with just Triple they J? They should start with them together. They should start with them together. I wouldn't bench Triple J. That's what you're asking. <laughs> That's not what I was asking. That's very much not what I was asking. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> That's, uh, so, yeah, I would play them together. <laughs> That's Santi Aldama, Erasure. That's a Spanish national team. Olympian Santi Aldama getting moved to the bench for Zachary Eady. Future team Canada member? No. I. So, there's... Win projection is 46 and a half. You went 47. I actually went 46. And technically, we tied. And if you add in Dylan and Jack, who went 48 and 45 wins, we still all tied uh, for the projections here. I, I I think this team might take a little bit more time to gel altogether. Um, and while they have a lot of depth, I don't know that they have a, a lot of like versatile depth depth that i like or like like the their depth is kind of clustered in like power forwards and shooting guards um that kind of like two through four range where their point guard rotation i expect them to start both smart and morant so the first point guard off the bench is scotty pippen jr um if, as far as bigs go if you start big with Edie and jerry jackson jr your next center off the bench is jay huff like yeah, you could probably sit play Santi. You can you can stagger, you can rotate around where you never really need to go to that third guy. Um, but I, I think it's kind of a weird mix. I think having smart Morant and Bane is just gonna have you really kind of small on the perimeter. And you were picking on Quentin Grimes being your your small forward. Well, that's that's Desmond Bain, except for a negative wingspan. And if your shooting guard is Marcus Smart and your point guard is John Morant you're tiny out there like that that could be a problem um and so i i see 46 as kind of like a ceiling less so than a floor i'm i'm lower on what i think they could be and that's barring any you know major injuries or barring any sort of big flare-ups um just just taking the team a while to congeal and figure out what they are Yeah, it is an interesting. Am I muted? No. no good. It is an interesting piece with um, their kind of front court or their their back court depth with um, Jaw, Smart, and Bane. That is kind of an odd group. And you mentioned that. I think the piece people are missing is that when the Grizzlies were really good, like fifty wins, best team in the league. They were the best teams in the league. That's like the, the kind of the big point. And they're not going to be close to that this season. Jaron Jackson Jr. is a great defensive player. But like of those teams of years past, like having Steven Adams, Dylan Burks, one of the best wing defenders in the league, those guys are gone and not really replaced with much. I think they'll be good, but they're not just going to be like, oh, Jaws back. Let's just keep you know, winning 50 games again because that defensive aspect isn't there anymore. And one of the other things that really helped them was when Ja would get hurt in the past, you put in Tyus Jones, and Tyus Jones is a very capable floor or general. He also is one of the best assist to turnover guys, like in league history. He's he's incredibly efficient. He does not make mistakes. And that could be a big problem with Smart, where Smart gets too aggressive and Smart shoots bad shots or Smart tries to do too much. And now all of a sudden you're in transition. 
and trying to get back on defense in time. And if Smart's made the error, who else is getting back? Like Desmond Baines, not really great transition defender. Jaron Jackson, not really great. If Zach Eady is your center, like, boom, you make a mistake on offense. You have a turnover. The other team is scoring. Like, you're just not able to get back in time. And Smart was awful last season, like, to be clear. Um, he took nearly seven threes a game, 31% there. Like three turnovers to four assists per game, two steals a night, but it wasn't really impacting defense. I just, I don't feel like last season he was really phoned in and then he got injured. And I'm curious to see like, what, what does Marcus Smart look like at this point of his career? But, uh. Yeah. Gotta, gotta be tough for Smart. Just, you know, watching the Celtics finally win a title as soon as he's gone, they win it with defensive guard presence. Like, He's like, that could have been me. And you guys didn't even use Porzingis. He was out for half this. But I've I've delayed you long enough. 45 and a half wins. Sacramento Kings. You have them at 51. I have them at 48, which is both a very solid over. Uh, basically, every one of us went over, except for Dylan, who does things to spite us. Um, he does. Tell me why yeah. we should be high on the Kings, the 0 and 5 preseason Kings. <laughs> Just a disaster in the preseason. I'll, I'll mention the three point shooting. We shot 25% from three. I, I want to go back at some point, like in the last 10 years, has preseason mattered at all? Like, how is that? Um, I will say, because I did, I did track this in my younger sports days. Uh, the Lakers, when they won their five titles between 2000, and 2010 they were like one in four on average sometimes they go oh and five and i actually would cheer for them to go oh and five because in my mind that meant they were like saving themselves they were ready they weren't interested in this preseason they're like let's let's ramp it up whereas like the teams that are really excited for preseason that are out there playing their guys it's because they suck and they know those guys aren't like good that's that's you're putting kate out there you're putting you know so that's that's my take. Don't check the box scores and see that the Kings have been playing mostly their starters. Don't check that. <laughs> the Kings starters aren't getting 35 minutes in the preseason, right, Nate? That'd be ridiculous. Um, Damana Sabonis, Aaron Fox, and DeMar DeRozan play in regular season games and win regular season games. That's kind of the basis. You can say there's going to be a spacing issue come playoff time. I bet there will be. But we have incredibly durable, high production, impactful players that will be able to win regular season basketball games. They're built for the regular season better than any other team, practically. Uh, Dorado Rosen played the most minutes in the league last year. Yeah, uh, Harrison Barnes is the worst player of all time, and now it's Dorado Rosen. That is an offensive upgrade that I can't even begin to describe and a defensive upgrade that no one even mentions. That's how poor Barnes got last year. And I feel like defensively, the Kings really started to find an identity post all-star break with a top 10 defensive rating by starting Keon Ellis, having one of the best wing, one of the best guard defenders in the league, also shooting like 45% from three. He's looked bad in preseason. Every Kings look bad in preseason, but I'm really excited for who might be a pretty good, like defensive Kings team. You found a way to build a great defense around a batter and protector when the bulls did it a couple years ago around Vucevic. It's like, Hey, if you have Crusoe and Lonzo ball and like these win and DeRozan is on that team too. Like you can be good defensively. And I think the Kings will actually kind of replicate that strategy. Maybe with some more offensive upside. De'Aaron Fox is not a great defender, but he is really disruptive. I think he was close to the top five, top 10 in the league in deflections last year. Or like Swiper the Fox. Yeah, he gets in there. He can disrupt things. Things If you have that with Keon Ellis and Keegan Murray, you're going to be fine. Um, If Devin Carter, is Devin out for the whole season or is it just like the first six weeks? Or? They're saying December to February. That's a big range. <laughs> That's a really yeah. big range. But and when he comes back, though, I'm really excited for it. Um, That's like Jordan when my wife asked me what played when I'm well. going to. That's like when my wife asked me when I'm going to finish a house project. And I'm like, yeah, December to February. And she knows that means <laughs> next year. <laughs> next year. There you go. Does it, who knows what's going on? Just, um, yeah. We were playing McLaughlin replaces Davion, but he's actually much better 
on both ends. He shoots the ball better. Um, despite being a little bit shorter, his wingspan is, is good. Um, and he's more active off ball. So, yeah, I mean, I think about it, it's like, hey, the worst players last year that were basically Davion and Barnes are, and Chris Duarte are gone. Nice job. We like we got rid of our problems, and maybe we just brought on new ones. But overall, I feel like like how could you look at this team that won forty seven games last year or forty six? I always forget the number, and it, it replace Harrison Barnes with Demar Derozan and be like, eh, I don't know, one extra win. It's like, dude, are you kidding me? Harrison Barnes is worth negative nineteen wins last season. We could win fifty five games. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I do think you have to always be a little bit concerned with, you know, health. Both you were fully healthy last year. A lot of other teams weren't. Right? We As weren't. you guys. But we weren't healthy. That's the thing. We weren't healthy. We pl- Our guys play in games. games Fox they're, miss? they're durable. The thing is, our players are durable, but Fox had okay. injured shoulder the entire season. Sabonis was like, like, and, and that, so like, our that's what I'm saying. The regular season wins will come because uh, Hardenstein misses five to six weeks with the same broken hand that Sabonis played through, right? Worst break? More, no. More important break, use of hands? Breaks. No. Hands? No. <laughs> All right. I'm, I'm just saying, you know, yeah. it, it can even out. You lose Sabonis for a little bit of time, and now you're starting Alex Len. I like Alex Len. That's, I hope you that's a rough look. No, he's a great rim protector. If um, we start out, Alex Len, if he starts for the Kings, we're the best defense in the league in those games. That is the best defensive team in the world. Fox, Keon, uh, Keegan, Demar, and Len is a number one defense. I will take Don't that. Don't ask about offense. I Don't ask take... about offense. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do like the Kings' volume of three point shooters. Yeah, you know, if mm-hmm. Kevin Herter can return to close to what he was two seasons ago, or really just kind of his career mean as opposed to what he was last year, Keon Ellis, Malik Monk, Trey Lyles, like Keegan Murray. You have five Fox. good shooters in the rotation and outside of your main guys. Like, was you know, Fox, DeRozan, Sabonis will be setting things up, will be the like offensive engines, having the spacers around them. Basically, everyone else that expects to get minutes aside from Alex Len is, is a good shooter. So, um, don't I, just, do you know how many threes Alex Len made in Atlanta? Uh, 14. In 2019, how many threes did Alex Len make in total that season? Four, 14. 74. 74. He Alex took Len. 204 threes that season and made 74 of them. He's a stretch big, but no one ever utilizes him like that. And oh, Doug McDermott, speaking of... Uh, Doug Lisa, McDermott. I, I think it's a really good Dougie. point, honestly, though. Because I think Fox took I was... too many threes last year. The shoulder injury really hurt his ability to drive and he launched threes less threes from fox derozan can take what he usually takes if sabonis takes more threes i'm gonna kill mike brown myself and then you let all the other great shooters spot up because they're good at that you don't have to push sabonis nate that was the dumbest thing i've ever heard a king's a king's person a person employed by the kings say you know how hard that is when mike brown said he wanted sabonis taking three to five threes per game you know how many dumb things I've heard? That was the dumbest one. In Sacramento? In Sacramento. Dumber than Stauskas? Stauskas? When you're shooting? Let's get Stauskas. It was dumber than... Because see, at least that was with good intentions. Mike Brown was being, like, vengeful when he said that. He was being evil. I <laughs> I will just say, I feel like that's a thing that every coach says during every offseason. So, yeah, we want yeah. our center to shoot more threes. Like, J.J. Reddick said it about what Anthony Back Davis... This, yeah. uh, Mike Budenholzer said it about Yusuf Nurkic. It's just like, hey, how do we solve our offensive woes? It'd be really great if our center shot threes. <laughs> What's the point of having Darren Fox, DeMar DeRozan, Bleak Monk, Keegan Murray, if all these great offensive options, if you're going to have your center take the least important, like the least efficient shot possible because he doesn't make them. Okay, we need to move on from Sacramento. I, I, I'm going over. We're going to be healthy because they, they always are. It's a good regular season team. All right. Uh, In a shocking twist of fate, it's here. Also with 45 and a half wins, the Kings nemesis, their Bane, the Pelicans. Now, I went over. I went with 47 in wins here. You went with 43. Uh, 
turns out actually the majority of us went under both Jack and Dylan joining you on the underside. Is it just a health thing for you? Is it the fact that Daniel Tice is going to be their starting center? Uh, is it the fact that Carlo Matkovich is their backup center? Or yeah. where is the doubt coming in? Yeah, no, their starting center is Herb Jones. They okay, they said that, and they're going to do that. And I, I you, you, you laugh when I say that, but then you, they literally have Daniel Tice. I like, I think it's Yves. Vives, Y V E S M I S S I. Yeah, um, really love him. Like crazy shot blocking, rebounding prospect. He's way too raw to play, but at the same time, like, dude, Herb Jones can't play center. OG played center a little bit in New York, and he turned in to to dust in about ten games. I, I just don't see the viability of the roster. I don't like Dejounte Murray. I hate how he fits to this team. Zion is not that effective or healthy most of the time. Ingram misses a bunch of games. I don't know. I feel like if you blew this team up and like redistribute all their players, they'd make impacts, but together I just hate it. Oh man, if you could just expansion draft, like an inverted expansion draft where everyone could just take their favorite Pelican, every team every other team gets better. All right. I, I yeah. hear that. Um so my thought with them is that they're a little bit like injury proof in that. Okay. Brandon Ingram gets hurt. Cool. That's more minutes for Herb and trade page Murphy. Okay. Um, CJ McCollum's hurt. Jose Alvarado gets, gets in the rotation. Like I think they have enough pieces one through four that they, that if there are injuries, they will all be fine um, to deal with the center issue. I, I kind of have a slightly different take on the Herb Jones of it all. Well, they said that they were going to play Herb Jones as their center or that Herb Jones was going to kind of functionally be their center. And in my mind, those are two very different things. Um, are you going to trot him out as the five to start a game and he's going to be the primary defender on Jokic? I don't think that's what's going to happen. I feel like I do feel like I'm up here doing spin for Donald Trump. Like, how do we make this crazy thing sound somewhat reasonable? <laughs> but um I think what they meant is that he's going to be their like last line of defense, their rim protection. Because you could put a body like Zion on um, one of those bigger centers to try to keep them away, and then you need to have like the back again to help. And Herb, lengthwise, may be able to do that. I don't think I it's just, a great plan. No, it's a terrible plan. I, this is like the this is one of the worst have, constructed rosters in the league. Makes no sense. Have I told you my my conspiracy theory? What is it? My conspiracy theory is that they were calling Minnesota every day, being like, hey, Ingram for Carl Anthony Towns, Ingram for Carl Anthony Towns, Ingram for Carl Anthony Towns. And then finally, Minnesota was just like, like Knicks, I know you want Towns. Pelicans are calling us every day. <laughs> you got to give us something more than Randall. Can we get Dante? If you give us Dante, we'll make this happen right here right now i just can't take another call from the pelicans i don't want to hear from them again and that's how that deal happened are you allowed to block numbers in the nba like is it like against some policy to be like i'm blocking you <laughs> like you these teams cannot make so. trades because the gms block each other i just the the there's two issues the rim protection is a huge problem and then the three-point volume i think is a problem um john de murray takes a lot of threes but he's not necessarily great at it uh, Ingram does not take threes. He, he, you think he does, but he doesn't. He takes like three a game. No, Zion doesn't. does not take threes. Herb Jones takes threes, but not a ton of threes, like three or so for a game. I'm just not sure. Like they're relying a lot on they're not good. They like pl they are relying on players that are worse than their starters for their three point volume. I think if you like combine it all, you say, Hey, this team has three point volume. They had perimeter defense. They could make this work, but then you actually have to pick five of them to play. You actually have to make it work. And I just, I think yeah. when that's going to happen, you're going to run into like, this team's just not that good. I I think we're going to see a lot of Trey Murphy, a lot of her about there. I, I don't know who gets moved to the bench. Um, unfortunately, it might just be CJ McCollum, which is kind of, hurting the thing that you're trying to help by putting out more of the the shooters but i'm i'm just saying if they had like a normal center if they had valanchunas back 
this is an easy 48 win team in my mind. Um, and, and I guess I have him at 47, so that's one win worse versus without him. I think they're going to figure out a way to plug the center hole or or make it work. And if not, and they just stay small all, all year and they're just functionally a horrid defense, they're going to be an amazing offense if they stay small like this. How would who like is Jokic gonna have 50 against them every time? Who's guarding him? And now I also sure. feel like without Milan Shunas, like how many now Jokic's this, are there? There's one really important one, but also like Sabonis is gonna give them problems. Where now it's like they owned us last season, but now I, I don't think they will because you have the like they literally don't have a center. Are you saying they owned you because they had Valanciunas? Yeah. That's where that that okay. was that was the reason I watched those games. Jonas Valanciunas is like Sabonis struggles with that for that kind of guy. It, it, he just neutralized him, and so without that, I'm like, we now we're gonna beat the Pelicans all four times. Okay, we better move on. Okay, <laughs> you heard it here first. Uh, all right. I hate these Vegas numbers. Um, the ninth team, the Golden State Warriors, forty three and a half. Both of us went over, although slightly. Uh, you you hire 46, me 44. Uh, Jack took the under on this. For me, I'm just going to say, when started to get sparse, you started to look around this and you're like, how many teams can be over 500? And like, how many teams can be like significantly over 500? Not just like a game or two. And Golden State, you've said it now multiple times about teams bench being better than the starters. I think potentially aside from Steph Curry, that could be true of a lot of their guys. Like, I don't, I don't know how you play this rotation. I'm looking at their their lineups and I'm like, maybe Kaminga starts, maybe Wigan starts, maybe Draymond starts, maybe Trace Jackson Davis, maybe like there's just too many guys that could maybe start and no one that I'm like that guy outside of Steph Curry should 100% be the starter. I ended up with them as the sixth best starting five in the in the West. Um, Which guys? Not, I, I forget who I plugged it at this point. Uh, but they, uh, it was it was like a it's all thing. Um, but then their their bench is also just really good. Like they have one of the like better than one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, they are the best bench. They have the best bench in the Western Conference. And so you end up with like, yeah, this team is pretty good. I think basically you have Steph and an infinite amount of interchangeable players that you, if you just took the names off the back of the jerseys, you wouldn't even notice like substitutions are being made. And they'll be able to break 500 through that. I hate that with Steve Kerr. Steve Kerr okay. yanks guys around. <laughs> he, start, he starts guys randomly. Like... <laughs> I, I want I want very clear lineations with Kerr where it's like these are your five starters, Kerr. No, no, these it's are gonna your be five bench. He gets a little too cute with it, except for the Olympics. The Olympics would have been a perfect time for Kerr's usual. All right, now you're gonna get thirty, and you're he did it like once, and then he's like, all right, Tatum, sit your ass down. Like, what like Warriors player is gonna uh, try to go full with Charles Sprewell first? Because someone's missing out. Buddy. Buddy healed. Yeah. Had... <laughs> mm. it's... No, because Buddy healed's and lighting it up in preseason. And then you say, hey, Buddy, by the way, like you're playing 15 minutes a night. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, I'm, I'm assuming Dr like Draymond is the obvious guy to pull Latrell Sprewell. But that's, that's almost too obvious. And him and Kerr, if it hasn't happened yet, he's probably not going to choke out Kerr. So I think I think Buddy's my next best choice. If Usman Garuba deserved minutes, maybe. But like Usman is just happy that a team gave him. I don't even know if he'll make the roster. He was on the roster when I built out my spreadsheet. But like if he's cut by the time I edit this pod. Who knows? Mm. Um, yeah. All right, let's let's speed through some of these teams because basically at this point we've we've talked about the nine uh, nine teams teams that will make the play in tenth team. Both of us agree with forty two and a half wins per Vegas. We both took the over. The Lakers. I've got forty five. You've got forty four. This is our play in field. Um, 
forty. That's one less than they had last year, right? I mean, Lakers I get last. Got, year. I think they got to forty six last year. Yeah, I thought they got to forty six. No, forty seven. So we both went uh, under the Lakers last year. They had the worst off season I, in the league. Does that feel weird? I guess I'm just not. What? They had the worst. How did they have the worst off season in the league. They didn't do anything. Their their team is ancient, and they didn't do anything. Okay. Counterpoint: The Washington Wizards exist. <laughs> what they do? I like. Uh, they had a great off season. <laughs> they built they, the draft. They got Malcolm Brogdon. Bob Carrington, it's, you guys would be starting Malcolm Brogdon. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> he's already injured. Malcolm Brogdon doesn't <laughs> play 25 games a year. But they're trying to tank. Here's the thing. I liked Dalton Connect. He was awesome last night. He's a, he's a, he's a pro-ready player that I think teams overthought again, just like Zach Eady. Um, Outside of that, though, you're just running back a painfully average offense and a painfully average defense. And you, now, now, like, is, I don't know how much Bronny's going to play, but that's that that's also kind of there. It's like every second he's on the floor is a last minute in the NBA. I don't know. It's tough. I think they'll be just as good as they were last year. But they, you know, do they not have, like, disaster potential? Because last year you got the best Anthony I mean, Davis season since, like, his Pelicans days. I'm not going to lie. I like how Anthony Davis is looking in this uh -huh. year. He's looking more aggressive offensively. But with Davis and LeBron, there is always disaster potential. There is the there's the cascading effect. If one of them gets hurt, this team is still so paper thin that the work volume and the like ask of the other one skyrockets so much that basically if one of them gets hurt, they both get hurt. And so you go from being a 45 win team to like a 20 win team so quickly. Uh just if if you lose one, you lose them both. So I think that's potential. The Lakers also don't have their pick this upcoming draft. Not that that matters a ton, but like there's no, there is no reason to pivot. There is no reason, you know, LeBron gets hurt and misses a bunch of games. Mm. The Lakers still try. The Lakers still want to be good, respectable. Um, and, and as far as their offseason goes, they didn't bring anyone new in, but Gabe Vincent has looked very nice in the preseason. Not like amazing. Dalton Connect it is going to be a real piece for us. And Max Christie has shown improvement. Um, and those three are three guys who provide the most valuable skill set the Lakers needed last year. And that's that's shooting. The second most valuable skill set the Lakers need uh is defense. And the defensive on off numbers when they have Davis and Jared Vanderbilt versus when it's just one or the other. Like the two together are fantastic and can really hold up a, a good Lakers defense. Vanderbilt is is not healthy again. Um, nothing we can do about that. But there there are reasons for optimism and for this to be a better Lakers season, just with the added three point shooting and once again the hope for Vanderbilt to get healthy at some point in his life. I can't wait to watch him like usual. Just always, it's always a fun watch. I like your guys' announcers. Um, can I say, I, I say uh, go ahead. on the announcers point, I watched the Phoenix game and I don't think it was the usual Lakers announcers, but they were, I want preseason announcers because the way these guys were calling it, um, I forget who drove the lane, but the, the call ended up being sideline on bounce. And they're like, who's that foul on? And they're like, that wasn't a foul. Oh man. The Lakers hit. They whacked the hell out of that guy. <laughs> We're just like, like you. I'm used to like Homer announcers that are like, yeah, like you know, you hit a guy in the face, like I ah, we made a play for the ball. And you're like, these guys were just, just like whatever. The, or, and there's like That's three funny. straight calls that went the Lakers' favor. That the the Lakers announcers were like, ah, we're uh, we are getting those calls tonight, guys. <laughs> and it, it just made me happy. That's fine. I do feel like the Lakers are like a 38 win team. Um, and I think they'll be, I, my prediction is they will head in that direction, whether it's because their team isn't that good or Davis gets injured and they won't win those games. And then they are going to make a trade. The Lakers are, some team is going to be like, I will give you 
a valuable contributor for nothing Lakers. Oh, please like my glorious Lakers. I'll do anything for you as Adam Silver holds a gun to their head, making them do it. Some, some team's going to bail the Lakers out in mid season, basically, whether it's Zach Levine for nothing or whether it's some other contributor for nothing, but there's going to be a mid season deal that takes them from 500 ish below 500 to an above 500 team. Listen, bailing out the Lakers is in the best interest for everyone. When the Lakers are good, there's more TV revenue, more people tune in to watch it, which <laughs> you know what? If you're just a middling market, if you're uh if you're the Nets or someone that like never has done well, well, Atlanta, even when Atlanta's good, their attendance is really low. You gotta have that high TV revenue. So you gotta have those Lakers being good. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> that's all uh, i got said what i said all right uh also vegas 42 and a half wins houston rockets we went with the under dylan don't just slap 45 wins on all of these teams it was freaking lazy oh i love you man but come on um let's rain on some parades let's poo poo it let's do it i hate this houston team I think they suck. Um, there are like it's them, the Pelicans, and the Warriors with like the infinite depth problem. The Rockets have fifteen equally mediocre players to shuffle around, all of which I like less than the one before. Um, we made a comparison another time, I think, unrecorded that it was. It's like getting the gigantic one pound candy bars for Christmas. You're like, that's incredible, and at some point, you're like, man. Is just a lot of candy bar. I don't know if I want to eat the same candy bar the whole time. The Rockets have nice pieces. No one is special, though. That's what bothers me. I like Shen Goon, but I don't like Shen Goon and Jalen Green. I like Jalen Green, but I don't like Jalen Green and Shen Goon. And so then how you kind of stir this pot, they're going to play 500 basketball with their starters. They're going to play 500 basketball with their bench. They're going to play 500 basketball with their third stringers, I bet. But it's all 500. Yeah. Yeah, you know, the the really great stretch of Jalen Green games came against a lot of tanking teams. Of it was like two games against Washington, two games against Portland, two games against Sid. It was out. out of the like of the thirteen fit. games. Yeah, and you know, as you start adding more pieces in there, everyone's minutes kind of get shrunk. And like there is, there are curves to this thing where you need enough time to like get in a rhythm. You know, if you're only in there for 10 minutes, then you get yanked. You don't have enough time to establish yourself. Like, what is the best case scenario for Houston this year? It's Reed Shepard looks great. Well, if Reed Shepard looks great, that means he's probably getting some of Jalen Green's minutes. So now Jalen Green doesn't look great. It's like any one of the guys, if one of them takes off, someone else has to, like, fall down because there are a finite number of minutes to play basketball. Yeah, you know, Thompson yeah. and Cam Whitmore, uh, Jabari Smith Jr. I love Jabari Smith Jr. I think Jabari Smith Jr. could be like a Jaron Jackson Jr. type of guy, um, like the kind of four or five combo. I think he has a lot of, of ability to play defensively. It, it's him, are him and Shangoon the right fit? Are they like, I just, I don't know what you do. There's too many different pieces and those pieces do keep their floor high because seven of them will play good at any given game um you know the other eight won't and so you'll be able to squeak out wins but i just i see them as a high floor but a low ceiling like having lots of good Basically, pieces doesn't make any one of them better it kind of kind of reminds me of the clay thompson point i brought up earlier like jalen green is good would you have this win total higher if he wasn't on the team no i would I would. I I would just say they get to play Shepard. They get to consolidate their lineups, and I'd say that's a better thing for them. Which is fine. Which is good. Hey, you have a, you have a valuable player that you could get assets for that you would probably win more games without. Congratulations. I I would love for them to make like a three for one trade, just Basically, package yeah. a good number of the young guys for someone who is rock solid, who is steady. But I don't know who that rock solid steady player is. Like, there's no Kawhi. one on the market. Trade for trade for Kawhi. Don't get now seriously. Bail them a bail. Give the Clippers. Hey, I'll give you two young players and and a in a protected pick. Give us Kyle Leonard. And if he plays, you you're awesome in Houston. 
And if it, if he and he doesn't play, you're probably still better off because they need to consolidate. Kawhi's just contract is so bad. I was trying to figure out a way for him to kind of get Chris Stops Porzingis, like just yeah. get dealt away to a team that you know can can absorb him. And if he plays, like it raises your ceiling, but you don't need him for your floor. And just his contract is is too high to figure out any way to make that work for anyone of of no. Mm-hmm. Hey, speaking of speaking of Kawhi. 35 and a half wins per Vegas for the Clippers. And that, that keeps dropping. That was like 42 a week ago. Uh, I snagged these right before we did the recording. Kawhi is now sitting out. Uh, the rest of the Clippers roster includes Derek Jones Jr., Mo Bamba, PJ Tucker, Kai Jones, Kevin Porter Jr., Bones, or no, Kevin Porter Jr. got cut. Uh, Bones Highland? Kevin Porter Jr. did not get cut. Yeah, he did. Really? He got cut. He got signed by the Chicago Bulls, and then he got cut again. Don't lie to me. No, he did not get cut. You're thinking of somebody else. Who am I thinking of? Who did the Bulls not sign Kevin and Porter cut Jr. the same day? I'm gonna verify. You give me your Clippers takes. Um, I was actually really in on the Clippers when I first started this. I was like, this Clippers team is gonna be really good. They have Kawhi, Harden, Derek Jones Jr., Man, Zubash. That's an elite starting five. One of like the four best in the entire West. And I and Kevin Porter Jr. is a terrible person, but he's gonna be production off the bench. Bones Halleck figure it out. Nick Batum, like they have nice pieces, but. It's a slippery slope from like, hey, this team, if healthy, can get 47 wins to the West is brutal. How about 35 wins? I'm honestly stoked. We're going to get to see ISO James Harden in 2024. I miss it. We all miss it. We all miss super heliocentric Harden. And now we're going to have it back. And I'm really excited to see that. It was Josh Primo. Is Josh Primo? Yeah, not Kevin Porter Jr. That that got signed and cut by the Bulls. Porter Jr. Sorry, I got is, them confused. Is like D'Lo, but worse. Basically, like we had made that comparison. Um, I, I think he'd be good. I mean, he's gonna be fine for what the Clippers are trying to do. They're gonna need offense. He's gonna be able to give that to him. I mean, yeah, especially without Kawhi. Kai Jones has looked fine. Um, Norm Powell yeah. is one of the greatest catch and shoot three point. I mean, shooters of like the modern era, just just an absolute knockdown bucket. And I actually, I don't like Harden and Zubach formed a great pick and roll. Zubach is a great screen setter. I do also think if you play Derek Jones uh, at the mm-hmm. five, go a bit smaller, but a bit more versatile defensively, being able to switch a little bit more, um, being able to play with a little bit more pace. Not that Harden plays with a lot of pace. I, I think this team has weapons, and I I was prepared to kind of try to make the case that like a bit of addition by subtraction, getting the role players, having Batum back, having having Derek Jones Jr., having Terrence Mann, having guys that like are willing to do the dirty work was going to really help the Clippers. But the fact that Kawhi is already hurt, man, the fact that Harden has come into this talking about how he's there, he's going to play like Luca. Like, let's go. not, Let's go. Is Harden the most valuable fantasy asset heading into next season? I'd take him first. I think my mom has him in our dynasty league. <laughs> good good for her. Good for her. I also uh, Chris Dunn, the, the originator for the Dunn or Dunn podcast that we uh that we oh, do yeah. in the off season. Yeah. Good player. They have Defender. pieces. They, they could Paul George and Kawhi Leonard could come back and I'd say they, they're a title contender, but it does that that ship is sailed. All right. Yeah. Um, another team for us to kind of rain on the parade. The San Antonio Spurs, 35 and a half wins. We both took the under. We went fairly convincingly under. You had 30. I have 32 wins. Um, I, I don't think there's a way to split this. Victor Wimbanyama is a fantastic, amazing player. He will be everything that everyone says he is. There, I, I've heard people talk about how LeBron James was top seven in MVP his second season and ask if that's a realistic possibility for Wemby, maybe. That's still, even if he is a top seven type of MVP talent, 
that still doesn't get them over 35 wins in my mind because the rest of the roster is so bad and so flawed and you already have injuries to Devin Vassell. Like, what are we, what are we doing? The 35 is insane. That's an insane, that's a delusional line that that's playing into people that are excited about Wemby. I can't even begin to fathom that Harrison Barnes is awful and Chris Paul has nothing left. That's just where I'm at. Like you're going to add these players and tell me okay. that you things are going to be different. I can't just what you can't just hate on Harrison Barnes every segment. Yes, I can. If he's playing for the Spurs. <laughs> he's playing for the Spurs. Harrison Barnes, less blocks than Jalen Brunson, less assists than Michael Porter Jr. last season. And you're telling me he's going to make a difference? We know. All right. No, I'm just, I'm just... just putting it out there. I, d- I did text you my sneak theory on Harrison Barnes <laughs> being out there to boost Jeremy Sohan's value because <laughs> Sohan looks so much better than Harrison Barnes. Like they share the court, and you're like, "Oh my God, Sohan! He's he's defending two guys. He's, he's so mobile. Oh God, Harrison Barnes just got smoked again. And there's there's Sohan trying to rotate over and help. And, you know, yeah. No, I like it. I like. It. I'm sorry. I do. I I take every single segment and did spit it into Harrison Barnes ruined my life the entirety of last season. Um, it's a disaster Thank of a you. roster, and eh? we're still rebuilding like a lot. I like the Stefan Castle pick. Chris Paul's a good like veteran leader, but he is he's so old. He hasn't I don't think he has anything left. I just think physically he has like a half season left. You're not gonna get much out of him. Um last season he played 58 games, 26 minutes a night. It's fine. Like it, it's good veteran stuff, but yeah, no, they're gonna really struggle. They're they're gonna be one of the five worst like defenses again. Yeah. And like, even if you're really high on Stephen Castle, Stephen Castle, like he's a good defensive player. He has shown limited offensive abilities just through his college days. I don't know that you're going to expect a great initial season from him. I would expect it to be kind of a rougher start for him than a lot of other guys is just the lack of talent around him. Um, trying to learn the point guard position from Chris Paul. Paul's shown that he can develop guys, that he's a great mentor. He, a lot of guys have spoken really highly after playing with him. It can be a bit tough playing with him, though. It He doesn't go easy on you. Um, but I have a question for you, Aaron. Mm-hmm. Who is the last Piston to score 50 points? Um, He's on this team, isn't he? Malachi Flynn. Yeah. Malachi Flynn. <laughs> I, yeah, <laughs> I was at the Pistons Suns game, and like the guys behind me were like, "Hey, who's the last Piston to get 50? And one guy like guessing all of these names that are like reasonable guesses. Like, like was it Blake Griffin? Was it you know, like mm. Reggie? Mil- was it Rodney Stuckey? Is it Brandon Jennings? Mm. It's the guy like, no, no, more recent, more recent, more obscure. And I. I get it from my mother. My mother inserts herself in conversations it's all the time. And I'm like, oh, I know this. Let me turn around. It's Sadiq Bay. Like, nope, it's Malachi Flynn. I'm like, fuck. How did I forget about <laughs> Malachi Flynn's random 50 piece? Man, um, gave him 50. But now he's a spur. Now he's a spur. spur. I think Popovich is losing his mind. Genuinely. <laughs> like, I think we're going to reach a point where it's like Greg Popovich needs to be like escorted out of the building. He's getting old, man. He's getting old. <laughs> All right, last two teams, hour and a half mark. Coming up. Utah Jazz, 27 and a half wins. Um, Jack went over. The rest of us all went under. I think there is a little bit of an over potential. Uh, Jack had 28, so half a win over. That's why Vegas Vegas did really good with their odds, I feel like. They know how to make money. They always do. Um, They always do. Good for Jack going over. I think we're going to see basically second half jazz last season. They, they kind of really started heading like the tanking direction and that's where you are now. And now it's a draft class worth doing it. Danny Ainge isn't going to fuck around. Like if you have yeah. any Lauren marketing, a Lori marketing bets for total points, get rid of him. He's not playing in that many games. I mean, they just, they, they're going to be tanking pretty hard. Um, but I like Isaiah Collier. I think like he fell to 29. He's one of the best players in the league or in the, 
he's one of the best prospects and just kind of like dissipated in the in the months leading up to the draft and i'm just kind of into it i i had the lakers picking him i thought this was going to be yeah kind of uh Hey, LeBron, you know how you want a USC point guard for the draft? <laughs> well, uh, we got you one. Oh, that USC point guard. Right, right, right. Yeah, no, didn't get that one. <laughs> um, But I, I hear what you're saying. I think I think Sexton is probably gone. I think Clarkson's probably going to be gone. Markinen's not playing more than 55 games. Not playing more than... 56 games maybe mm-hmm. we'll put him at 55 just for awards consideration not that, that he'll get any but for the awards is this, either way he's not yeah he's not playing he's not getting, he's not getting awards um so and he just, just kai luke's on this team great maybe we'll get to I see like some more guy. svi svi um i also want to mention that kyle filipowski they took in the second round that's that's someone who i thought the kings might take it like pick 13 and it's interesting to see both of us thinking about the two guys they ended up getting way earlier than they got them. Yeah. Um, the Lebowski was interesting. He ended up falling for some like personal reasons. Like his, like his, he, I think he was just so strange in the interviews. People weren't into it. If I remember correctly. Yeah. So it was, it was like a deal of, he's got a girlfriend that's like eight years older than him. Who mm-hmm. was his babysitter. Um, and then yeah. who groomed him. him in a lot of ways. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know why that affects his draft stock. Unless he was just, Listen, I think he was just really strange in the in the in the in the interviews. Or that was I very the, about that or something. I forget. I think making it in the NBA is such a difficult thing. Like, it's it's such a small group of people that make the NBA that if you see something off in like the personal or home life, if where you're like, hey, he's not talking to his family. He's kind of they've cut him out. He's cut them out. But there's there's all these weird dynamics like. I, I would worry about someone who doesn't have a good support system, who seems estranged. Like, it, it just, you need talent, you need drive, you need luck. And, like, if you don't have good interpersonal skills and a good family connection, I think that that hurts, hurts you and, like, can, can be another factor. Not that the guys whose dads are all over their games are doing great. Thinking about you, LeVar Ball. Thinking about you, T. Morant. Thinking about... Uh, you, Rick Brunson, I guess Rick, Rick's working out for his kid, but you know, I, I think I, I would be a little bit shaky about, um, kind of a weird family dynamic. I get it. All right. The final Western conference team, the Portland trailblazers, Vegas has them at 20 and a half wins. You and I smash the under going at 19, uh, Dylan and Jack are both slightly more positive. I think these are going to be one of the three worst teams in basketball. Um, maybe they'd be better if they were in the East, but like they are definitively, without a doubt, the worst Western Conference team. And are they the best play- worst team ever? Are they the no. worst team ever? That when you no, they're the the only team that's going to win less than twenty games that you could go through the roster and be like, I like all these guys. When I when I did the prep for the top 100, I set aside like eight Blazers, and it was like okay, <laughs> like wait a second, like they're like this team is terrible. They're not going to be good. Why do I like all these guys individually? Because they do have they have Anthony Simons who I like, Anthony Stiebel who I like, then the Advia, Jeremy Grant, DeAndre Aiden, Robert Williams, Scoot Henderson. These are good players. Shaden Sharp. These are good players. But okay. then just in practice, in, in when you actually apply this. They're terrible. They're just, the defense yeah. is so bad. It's one of those. This is my probably my my bet for worst defense in the league. Um, yeah, it's just not into it. That's that's what no, I was going to say. Is Washington like, will be worse. That's mean. Washington will be worse defense. All right, go ahead. Uh, that's just what I was going to kind of say. Is like if you look at their pieces, and you're like, I like them. I like Jeremy Grant as a team's third option, where he can score a little, but he's going to be you know a primary defender. That's not what he does. He's no longer playing as much defense. He's trying to focus more on offense. He's completely in the wrong role. Don't like him in Portland. Um, I like Shaden Sharp. Watching him is a lot of fun. He can throw down some really good dunks. He is an absolute sieve on defense, and he takes poor shots. If he was on the Pelicans, he's probably Jordan Hawkins. And that right. Andrew like, Aiden, right back up big. <laughs> now he's starting. It's like, yeah. 
I mean, I don't know. I I still struggle with Aiden. Aiden, my, yeah, Aiden's my second Aiden. choice. <laughs> his effort sucks. His effort sucks, but his talent is there, and it's it's prevalent. And like like I watch James Wiseman an hour before we start recording this, and James Wiseman just sucks. There's no effort. There's no talent. I watched DeAndre Jordan, and there's no effort, but there's still enough talent there that just makes me angry. Like I, I get physically mad when I watch him play because I'm like, you should be better. You should, should do be. things. Um, but, but he doesn't. It just, Alas, it just doesn't. I I think they'll still run into the problem of like running offense through Scoot Henderson. He's gonna like he's still raw. I think he has talent, but they're still trying to develop that. And then outside of him. I just, I don't know. I can't find it. The Simons, and I like Anthony Simons, but they're running into the fact that like this team is going to play miserably on both sides of the basketball all the time. They, they just don't have the ability to, to piece together five guys that I really like. But yeah, that's right. Matt. Matisse Thibel's still there, right? Yeah, they have Thibel. And I, I said I said they'd be the worst defense. They were 23rd last year. I don't know how they'd get, be, all of a sudden become the worst one, but I think you're still looking at a team that's going to, I, I, just, I guess the biggest piece is going to be like who's generating good offense at any point. Yeah. Simons, basically. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know how I feel about it. Anthony Simons' offense, but. All right. We did it, Nate. Congratulations. We made it through the West. Uh, we went over on the Thunder, Timberwolves, Nuggets, Mavs, Suns, Grizzlies, Kings, Warriors, Lakers. And although we both went under the cluster of four went over on the Blazers. We are under on the Pelicans, Rockets, Clippers, Spurs, and Jazz. So uh, good teams are good. Bad teams are bad. Let's have a great season. Aaron, where can people find you? Possible chairs on TikTok. Possible chairs on Twitter. My cameo to pay me to say propaganda about your favorite player, as well as my Patreon for all the great lists me, me and Native made. Find me, Nate underscore Hoops Temple, well, on TikTok. You email the show, hoopstemple at gmail.com. I have a Patreon where my whole NBA player matrix is available. If you want, just email me. I kind of like sharing the thing. Donation of your choice. Hit me up. Have a great week. <laughs>